Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, has everybody been really enjoying this conference? Has it been something that's been so overwhelming coming here, seeing all of these stories of what's going on in DevOps, just invigorating you to go back to the shop and destroy everything and start from scratch? Uh, every year I come, I go through the same thing. Uh, it's really a sanity check to see where my journey uh, stacks up against other people in industry and really see where I should be going in the next year. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. Are we there yet? Scaling DevOps for continuous improvements. Simple agenda. I'm just going to go ahead and do a little introduction, talk about a little bit the last time I was here, the next steps in my journey, the results so far, and uh, what are our remaining challenges. With our introduction, my name is Mark Priolo. I'm a software configuration manager. I have over 15 years of experience in the industry. I've worn multiple hats, including being a consultant, being a DBA, uh, being an IT operations manager, and also being a release manager. My company, Urban Science, more than a consulting firm, more than a software company. I was trying to find the easiest way to say what our company does in 30 seconds, and it really comes down to this. Think big data, and we come up with client unique solutions for our, uh, for our clients. What are our clients? We basically started in 1977, been profitable every year since, and we really started with the automotive industry. Uh, as one of my friends always likes to say, we had a college professor where somebody from GM came to him and said, hey, every time we sell a car, we have to put a pin on a board. There must be some newfangled computer or something that can help us out on this. Well, fast forward to now. We are in over 100 countries. We have offices in 19 of them. We're just around 1,000 employees. All the major auto manufacturers are our clients. On top of that, uh, pretty much all their dealers. We have the highest uh, business to business satisfaction in the industry. Now, taking a step back, really what we're trying to do is collect all the information that is possible to provide to our clients for them to make the most educated decision that they can. In the past, we tried to generate all these reports for them to really show them how they're doing. That's the past. Now we're going to the point of giving them statistics, giving them dashboards on ways that they can make decisions before the results really matter. Last time I was here, we were trying to start this DevOps journey. Now, how many people in here, when you started the DevOps journey or looking at starting it, you said, you know what, everything is fine. I, I, our IT operations is working great. Our development teams are working great. There's this thing called DevOps. I'm all over that. Uh, not, not my scene. It was basically, hey, we got a dozen page directions with go-to logic that we're giving to a guy for the first time he's ever seeing at 2 o'clock in the morning to do a deployment. We have tons of time that people are spending doing these redundant tasks. We have a lot of things that just were not scaling anymore. So when it came to that point, we really said, why are we doing this journey? Increase scalability, consistency, efficiency, expediency, and we wanted to reduce complexity. Now, at this time, we decided on our tool. And we said, you know what? Electric Flow is an orchestration tool that we felt that was going to be able to get us into that DevOps mode. Getting that out of the way, we had to figure, OK, what are our first steps in this journey? What are we going to tackle first to achieve a, more of a continuous delivery DevOps model? And we had two major choices. The most visible, these are the ones that your C-level people look at and say, why are, why are these projects taking a long time? And then you have the most mundane. These are the ones that everybody knows how to do. It's really boring. It's really repetitious. And it's not really a threat. But there's a lot of resources going into it. And it's kind of under the radar. Well, we went ahead and looked at tackling both of them. And we actually found out that starting the journey, going with the most visible, while it actually really did reduce our human error and com complexity, it didn't actually increase our speed too much. Additionally, not many teams wanted to radically do things different on a new project, which is radically different for them in the first place, too. And the ROI was actually pretty high. So instead, 
going down the mo most mundane, the ones who are actually very well documented, it was just that it was not highly visible. We found that we got the same re reduction in human error, but we had drastic speed in, uh, increases. We had higher adoption. On top of that, it was actually lower maintenance. ROI was in less than two months going with the most mundane. We actually freed up a lot of time where people are just simply following the same 10 steps every day, doing the same things over and over. So by far that was our winner. With that strategy under our hand, we said, okay, you know what? We, we got the first continuous delivery model. We're starting our DevOps journey. We got our win. We got a whole bunch of teams that are starting to adopt it. We started our momentum going down the journey. What are we going to do next? We're going to go ahead and automate 135 of our European and US uh, products. And then that was for our 2014 goal. Going on to 2015, we wanted to go ahead and say, you know what? We've been doing the continuous delivery for a little while. Let's take a step back. And that most visible one that we tried in the first place and didn't get the results that we were hoping for, we'll take what we learned over the time and we'll go ahead and tackle that again. And everybody that struggles with automated testing, we're definitely one of those teams. We're going to go ahead and really start tackling the automated testing. Let me tell you where we are now. The next steps in our journey. We're, so first of all, I'm on the software configuration management team, me and I'm one other person. So for our entire company, we have a few hundred products, uh, we do multiple deployments a day. Uh, at, and we're across the world, we have two people that support our team to provide these abilities to all these team members. So that means that whatever we provided had to be something that we could support. So what we did was we came up with a limited catalog of things we would support. This was actually a, a really good challenge because how many people here, each one of your developers team says, my product is special. Nobody else does anything like I do. That's the same thing with us. We had everybody that said uh, things were special. Well, the great thing is when we go ahead and we took a step back and we looked at everything that was special, we found out that their specialness was probably one or 2%. And almost everybody had 98% similar, which was actually really, get, really great when we were coming up with this catalog model. But that also allowed us to do standardization. And by offering a limited catalog, we could allow it to be really scalable and allow the team of two to support it. So we basically have three major pipeline offerings. We have a static pipeline, a dynamic pipeline, and a self-service pipeline. Now, the self-service has a little asterisk about it because this is one of those that we say, hey, development team, if you have the bandwidth, you have the vision, and none of the other two uh, matter or match up to what you need, We'll let you go ahead and work on your own model. You can use it just in the development world, and once you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and switch over to one of ours, or you can really flesh it out and go to production with it. Just when you get to ready to go to production, you got to check in with us to make sure you're complying to the company standards. The other two was developed by our team, and we collaborate with all the teams to make sure that it complies to the company standards and meets what our developers need. Static. Now, this is something that pretty much everybody that hears about pipelines, this is what pops in mind. When you're doing a deployment, you do that build, it's going to your CI or your development server. After it passes all your tests, it goes to your pre uh, QA server. After it passes all its tests, it goes to your staging server. Pass all the tests, it goes to production. So basically, as long as it's green, from dev to production, you got your pipeline, all is good. Now, the problem is, since our company has a, a lot of sharing between teams, we like to show our clients products uh, earlier on in the process. We want to do uh, different types of tef testing at different, uh, different stages of the life cycle. We don't, a lot of our teams don't have the ability to do a static pipeline. So we have what's called a dynamic pipeline. And this is basically, we switched over from the concept of saying it has to go from environment to environment to environment in this one static order with no sightseeing. Instead, what we said is artifacts go through a maturity cycle. 
And that maturity cycle is actually dev, QA, RTI, and RTD. Now, I've had a little conversation with our developers regarding the RTI and RTD. They say I told them what that meant, and they told me they um, vice versa. If anybody here knows what it is, please tell me after. I would really appreciate that. Uh, but basically, RTI is like release to internal or infrastructure, and then RTD is release to uh, deploy or something. The concept is the artifacts go through those maturity stages. At the same time, each, one of those, uh, each environment you have is marked as being one of those maturity stages. Now, only certain uh, one of those environments can say, this environment passed, it can go to the next. The others are considered dead ends. So for in this example, you went to dev, you said it was good, you went to QA, and when you went to QA, somebody says, hey, my customer wants to see it. It says, okay, we're gonna throw on the QA customer. And this is all still going down the regular pipeline. We can spin one off to the QA customer and it doesn't interrupt its path going down. At the same time, it's using the same logic and the same exact deployment model as going straight down the middle of the pipeline. This really gave the flexibility and what I'm showing here is really a simplification of what our dynamic pipelines does. What we really had to do was talk to our developers, talk to our business uh, owners, and really understand what they needed. And then we had to go back and look at the pipelines and understand what are, what's the achievement of a pipeline and come up with this hybrid, where we still get the same goals of a pipeline, but in a dynamic uh, model that are, uh, works with our clients. Now, after we did that, what kind of results did we get? Now, if you remember, I said in 2014, we have got our first win. We went ahead and said, yay, we're, we're, we're starting to see some good benefits here. And at that point, we were looking at doing 1,000, uh, annually 1,000 application deployments. We were avoiding around 2,000 man hours. And basically, we were say, hey, guess what? That one full-time employee that would have been just doing deployments, now that full-time employee can go off and do something that's more than just following simple directions. Fast forward to 2016, we're looking at doing 50,000 deployments a year. Manual uh, work hours avoided, just roughly over 22,000. And the actual employees not spending their time following mundane deployments is over 10. It's actually closer to 12. We're actually, each month, we're avoiding one year's worth of work for uh, an employee. Now, one other thing that's actually I got just like a, just over a month ago was when I was talking to some of our business owners and finding out how these models are working for them. One of our business owners actually reached out to me and said, uh, how many of you guys know what NPS is over here? Net Promoter Scores? This is where we reach out to our, uh, we have these polls that go to our clients and they rank how we're doing. We actually had clients come back and gave us better NPS because now they're able to deploy faster. And this is a situation where before they were able to go down a continuous delivery model, if the client called them up and say, hey, we need something changed, they say, sure, absolutely, it will take us five days. Now, switching over to the new model, client calls them at eight o'clock in the morning, we need this change. Most of the time, they would get it to them the same day. The clients actually noticed that we were able to deliver faster and it actually did result in a better NPS. To me, that's amazing. Usually when you go with these things, my clients are the developer teams, are the business owners. It's, my clients are usually not their clients. And I don't usually expect to hear back from their clients that, guess what, you guys are doing a good job. And that, when I heard it, is, I flat out said, I'm stealing that, I'm gonna have you do that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell your boss to talk to my boss about making sure the company is aware of this. So what's our remaining challenges at this point? Well, number one, my coffee is still not continuously deployed. That's my, 20, that's my 2017 goal. I gotta figure that out, but then I'm hoping to get that done soon. Uh, as a company as a whole, we're uh, still a little in the firefighting uh, concept, the reactive concept, and we really gotta start switching to the proactive mindset. While we're getting all these wins, we're getting all these uh, 
uh, abilities to deploy much faster, be more on a proactive front, still a lot of times uh, the way that we approach things is more from a reactive standpoint. Now this is really a key one, uh, and this is almost like a culture shock when you're trying to start going down the DevOps model, is rebalancing roles and expectations. Now you've probably heard a few of the other uh, speakings where you're talking about, hey, this is gonna get rid of a job, and that's really not the goal of going down the DevOps route. It's really about taking away the boring, the mundane, uh, paying somebody this much to do something that that low. If you got, if you hired somebody, most likely you hired somebody that was smart and extremely capable. So why are you having them follow simple directions? It would be much more useful if you had them do an engineering job or if you had them actually contributing instead of just doing, again, mundane stuff. And that's the mindset that has to go in when you're rebalancing these roles because it is going to disrupt the norm. And it's not simply saying, hey, guess what? Now you used to be doing deployments until three in the morning. We don't need that anymore. And the person's probably gonna think, oh great, what, now I'm gonna lose my job? Or I believe one other speaker said, uh, there's, there's that fork in the road. Either I'm gonna be paid half as much to do less stuff, or I'm gonna be paid twice as much to do more exciting stuff. And that's really, as a company, what you need to present to your teams is, there is an option for you to become more valuable going through this process because going down this route, we're going to provide opportunities for you to be more valuable. And education. Even though we're doing all this stuff, it's really about educating. Why are we doing it? What is the advantages to the company? What is the advantages to your team? Why is going down a continuous delivery and DevOps route really the better decision versus what we used to do? What's up next for us? I think you guys remember a few slides ago, I said automated testing was something on our 2015 and beyond goal. Unfortunately, it's in our beyond goal. Uh, doing automated functional testing has really been a challenge. Now, don't get me wrong, automated unit testing, anything that you do at the build time is not as much of a challenge and we definitely are, have that being uh, tackled. But getting functional testing has really been a challenge, a way to come up with standardized models that we can use. So after this, if anybody has any real good advice on the Windows shop and how to do that type of stuff, I'll definitely love to hear about it. Integrations into new systems. It's actually a lot easier now, but then every time you bring a new system to your environment, you want to make sure right from the uh, front that all your applications in your environment can communicate with it. So if you have orchestration tools like we have uh, SCOM, we have System Center, we have VMware, we have Electric Flow. We want to make sure that they can all talk to each other through API calls. We don't want to have at any point one human that has to get involved when these communications go on. So that makes sure anytime we get a new system, that's one of the highest priorities in choosing that system. Operations dashboards, which is actually great because the presentation here just before was talking about dashboards. And this is actually, to me, you know that you're a good way into your continuous uh, delivery and DevOps journey is when you have dashboards. Because while empowering the right people to do those deployments is a great start in the right direction, giving those people the information that they need to evolve their products in a proactive manner is just, import just as important. Because if they can push it out to production, but then they don't realize that they're, they're peaking out their CPUs at 100% until a client calls up and says, hey, our, your program is down, is not the most beneficial because then at that point you run into a whole problem. They don't have insight into production and now you're getting more people involved than what's needed. We need those dashboards where basically they push it to production. They say, hey, something's abnormal. Let's go ahead and push a, a fix out before the customers call in and complain. And this is really the, in the whole DevOps journey, you always want to continuously improve, enhance, evolve, and reinvent. You never stop. The journey is a journey. It's, there's never a destination. And that's really the mindset here. Even though we have all these wins up uh, as per the Phoenix project, you never stop. You always have to make sure you keep coming back, keep enhancing, keep looking at the industry, coming to these type of events, talking to other people, really just making sure that what's going on in the industry, what's going on in your company, that you are keep moving forward. 
because moving, uh, staying still is falling back. Now, we've got a few links here that I recommend. Number one, uh, it may sound funny, uh, but then Toastmasters. And now remember, DevOps is a culture. And an important part of a culture is communication. Now, when you communicate with other departments, you've got to make sure that you're able to articulate the reasons why we're going on this journey, the advantages, in a very well-prepared manner. On top of that, you can do presentations at conferences. But I, I don't un understate the importance of Toastmasters for me. I thought it really helped me out, and I've seen other people go through it, and it really allows the communications to go much smoother. Now, this is a shameless plug on my side. I actually run two, dev, uh, two meetups in Southern California. So if anybody here from Southern California, especially in the Orange County area, I run a SoCal Continuous Delivery Meetup and an Orange County DevOps Meetup. And with that, I try to get people from the industry over there keep talking about the challenges that are going on there. We try to get vendors to come in and talk about uh, some of the use cases that they've had. Uh, another shameless plug, uh, Urban Science is hiring, specifically my mighty team of two. I'm trying to make it three, so if anybody, 50% <laughs> increase, woohoo. So if anybody's interested, uh, please check it out. And uh, last but not least, uh, Electric Flow. They've really been the orchestration tool that has helped us with our continuous delivery models. And with uh, three minutes left, and of course my mouse Stops working there. Uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, I guess that was easy. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>